Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, Tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Happy Friday, guys. Molly here with some quick announcements. It's back. Dr. Vera Tarman's I'm Sweet Enough Challenge. Be part of the sugar-free movement. Are you ready to quit sugar? Commit or recommit to the September Sugar-Free 30-Day Challenge. Eliminate all added and processed sugars from your diet between September 1st to September 30th. This year, Vera will have some live cooking videos. You'll definitely have access to the Kick Sugar Summit, which will be September 1st through the 8th. And there will be ongoing daily free Facebook peer support. Prizes for success are also going to be available. Be sure to register for the September challenge today by going to foodjunkiespodcast.com. I wanted to take a moment to remind you that Dr. Vera Tarman's Sugar and Food Addiction course with Dr. Eric Westman's Adapt Your Life Academy will be live at the end of September. So head over to the Adapt Your Life Academy or Food Junkies podcast website for the link. I also wanted to take a moment to share with you my latest passion project, YouTube. If you haven't heard, I'm seeking volunteers willing to share their stories on the Sweet Sobriety YouTube channel to decrease stigma and increase awareness around food addiction. Day one or day 1001, we want to hear your story. If you're interested, please check the show notes for more information or head over to the Food Junkies website and follow the link. Today, Vera and Clarissa interviewed Dr. Sandy Van. They discuss Dr. Van's personal and professional path to bariatric medicine, the psychological and behavioral aspect of obesity medicine, Dr. Van's hybrid program, different phenotypes for eating behavior, weight bias and weight stigma, precision nutrition, volume eating, obesity medicine guidelines, post-surgery interventions, CBT in the medical setting, how to support the concept of food addiction acceptance in the medical community, leading promises of obesity medicine today. What's next for Dr. Sandy Van and our signature question? All right. Welcome, Dr. Van. Welcome to the Food Junkies podcast. My name is Dr. Vera Tarman, and I am your host today, along with Clarissa Kennedy. Today, we speak with Dr. Sandy Van. Dr. Van is a medical specialist in obesity medicine. She is staff physician at MedCam and runs a virtual management program in downtown Toronto. Unlike your standard bariatric physician, she has a unique focus in treating not only the physical and pharmaceutical aspects of obesity, but also the psychological and behavioral dimensions. We at Food Junkies, a podcast, are especially interested in how Dr. Van works with her patients psychologically, although we want to talk about the other stuff too. So welcome, Dr. Van, and uh, well, hello. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, super thrilled that you are are willing to take the time here. So please tell us, how did you, first of all, we we like to get the personal stuff first. What got you interested in bariatric medicine in the first place? Yeah, I've always been interested in nutrition and I have background training in in family medicine, similar to yourself. And uh, when I was a resident, all I noticed was that we were creating sort of, it seemed like band-aid solutions for problems that were stemming from one single etiology for not for everybody, but off commonly, which was obesity. And a lot of the things that we would be presented with were hypertension, diabetes, fatty liver. And these were all things that were rooted in higher body weight. And it led me to think, okay, I think that there's a way that we can try to prevent at least some of these conditions from occurring. And then I looked at uh, some of the weight loss intervention programs at the time, about you know nine years ago, uh, there wasn't that much available to us. And a lot of it was a uh, dietary in focus. And I remember at the time thinking to myself, wow, this is actually very, very hard medicine. And I was told by a family medicine doctor, if you wanted to just talk to people about their food, then why didn't you just become a nutritionist? Not even a dietitian, a nutritionist. And at that time, I thought, you know what? I'm just going to continue to pursue this because I think it's a niche that nobody really talks about, only a handful. And then I got to meet a number of obesity physicians. And I remember seeing Vera Tarman's book online and seeing the initials ABAM at the very end. I don't know if you remember this, but when I reached out to you, I was like, 
oh my gosh, you're doing food addiction and you're doing obesity medicine. And I was really interested in a B O M, but I just understood yours as a a bomb. And you were like, no, I do addictions. I'm an addiction stock, but I deal with food addiction. And that was a really enlightening experience for me. So that just contributed to my learning. And over the past six or seven years, I've devoted myself entirely to the field of managing obesity. Yeah. So just for people listening, so it was the American Board of Obesity Medicine, you, yes. and then I'm the American Board of Addiction Medicine. Addiction Medicine. Yeah. That's anyway, right. I, I'm glad that there was that mistake because I wouldn't have met you then. I know. I remember, yeah. I remember true. thinking then, how did you uh, uh, find out about this whole thing? But anyway, that's how. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so that's how you got into bariatric medicine. So how did you, what made you get interested in the whole idea of psychological and behavioral? Because that is a fairly, I don't know if it's new, but it's not, it's not that common. It's not common, but I think that it's highly sought after by the people who struggle with their eating and their weight. And so I noticed this when I was, um, I won't name the the person I was working with, but it was a very, it was a clinic that um, offered a very restrictive metabolic diet, almost similar to keto, but not high fat. It was just high protein. It was a, it was a program where patients were told specifically to cut out all carbohydrates and then only be eating proteins and vegetables. And you would see at this time that when patients were following up every couple of weeks that they would see weight loss, but over time they would find it to be a deep struggle to be able to maintain and adhere to the the dietary modifications. And there was just one time I was unsupervised and I decided to ask about what she felt was the reason why she was overeating. And she burst into tears. And I vividly remember her crying and saying, nobody has ever asked me that before. And I've struggled with this my entire life. And and that to me was like, I had a visceral response to that because I thought, wow, this is just clearly an underdeveloped area of counseling. And at that time, we were only limited to eating disorders. So you could get help for that under the guise of having anorexia, bulimia, or binge eating disorder. But for somebody who had quote unquote bread and butter obesity, it was something that wasn't really offered at that time. And then I started doing work with cognitive behavioral therapy in the realm of mood disorders. And there were clear overlaps with being able to try to tackle unhelpful thinking patterns, not only with mood, but with eating behavior. And so I started transitioning my work over to obesity medicine under the mentorship of another uh, physician named Dr. David Macklin, who, who really was the pioneer of CBT for obesity management. Okay. And so then you got interested in the behavioral, like pretty much exclusively, is that what you do? Or is it just a part of your larger practice? Initially, at the time that I started about six years ago, it was predominantly cognitive behavioral therapy for obesity medicine. I would do the high fidelity sort of treatment program where it's like limited to 12 to 20 something weeks. And you're seeing me for 75 minutes. It's according to, you know, the ministry of health billing structure where you can see people at 75 minute increments. And I would see like only six patients a day and it wasn't very scalable. Right. And at this time I was only offering CBT and I was seeing that patients were losing weight, but they were never reaching a weight that they were fully satisfied with. And they would be plagued with a lot of hunger and higher appetite And it wasn't, I came into this at a good time because there was a lot of advancement in medical treatment for obesity. That wasn't like some of the older medications. It was actually tackling appetite regulation and in ways that were deemed to be safe based on some of the clinical studies that we have now. So I started incorporating that. And over time, I found that patients required less and less time in appointments. There was less CBT required because their wanting and their appetite drives were blunted or dampened. And they just felt, a lot of them just felt normal around food. So over time, it became 40 minute appointments and once a month instead of once every two weeks. And then slowly over time, because I needed to be more scalable, I needed to see people in 20 minute increments. But with the advancement of medication, it's possible to actually do that because people actually find that they have much less to talk about and that there's less complexity to their eating behavior. I won't say that it completely cures it. So I tie CBT into medical management and I consider it a hybrid program. Yeah. 
Wow. And I want to ask you more about this a bit later, but in that uh, process of seeing that people were actually fine with their appetite and they didn't need as much time, you must have seen, or did you see, I don't want to put words into your mouth, uh, that there were there was a smaller subsection of people that um, still needed time because maybe... Oh, yes. Yeah, like, like that might be the food addicts amongst us. Like, yeah. So I guess, did you find that there was a food addiction amongst there or do you not acknowledge that? Well, I, I understand that it is a contentious topic in clinical medicine only because it hasn't yet formally been diagnosed and the, the research on it is pro- becoming more and more advanced on it, but we just don't have the data yet to put it in the DSM. And so for that reason, I don't necessarily speak about food addiction with patients voluntarily. But what I do acknowledge is that there are different phenotypes of eating behavior. And there's a spectrum for the way that people behave around food. And that at the higher end of the spectrum, there are people who will identify food addiction-like behaviors. Like they'll use that terminology with me, which I will totally honor and respect. And then there's people who are born with a very lean predisposition, oftentimes not thinking about food and not caring about it, right? So, so I do acknowledge that there's variation in patients' appetite. And it wasn't even so much that I had to see people for longer CBT sessions because medication wasn't necessarily touching their appetite. I can only think of a handful of patients that that has happened for. It was more so the self-criticism that they still continue to have surrounding mm. their weight, the way they perceive themselves, the fact that they were on medication for weight loss. And so a lot of that is also rooted in their experiences, like being victimized for their weight, for instance, at an early age and having their their yeah. upbringing be shaped by the fact that they weren't a lower body weight and having that erode at their self-worth. And so a lot of that is deeply steeped in weight bias and would be high risk for non-compliance with medication or follow-up. And so being able to disentangle that and help people understand unhelpful thinking patterns that would drive unhelpful behavior, like giving up altogether, was the reason why I would continue seeing them a little bit longer. And then there are people, um, like I can think of a couple right now, who exhibit what they would describe as addiction to, to food, waking up in the middle of the night, wanting to seek out pop, for instance. And these are people who often, I notice, have concomitant mood disorders like depression or anxiety that's maybe being suboptimally treated that is refractory to the medication and the therapy. And those are big mystery patients for me. I can't. So to answer your question, do I diagnose food addiction in those people? No, but would, should I probably be doing a Yale food addiction scale on them? Probably like I'm being prompted to think about that now. And is abstinence something that may be of utility to them? Likely, because there are some people who just have this reward drive that is clearly exploited by specific food groups that they can't eat mindfully because they're too vulnerable. But if, if I can say, um, Sandra, uh, from what I know about your practice, I think you're not giving yourself enough credit because you do, I believe, refer people to, I don't want to say names either, but yeah. you do know of people that you can refer people when they're obviously food addicts. And oh, yes. Like yeah. And oh, now, yeah. So I forgot I, to mention, I'm the co-founder of Three Sales with Sandra Elia, who is a food addiction counselor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah don't, no, like, I just don't, don't talk under- about that a lot with her. Yeah. But don't under oh that's the kind of stuff we like yeah. talking about. So don't underestimate yeah. your your influence and your knowledge about this. You do. It's partly why I wanted to speak with you. Oh, thank you. But but you you did mention something I want to go back to, which I think is you're probably a good person to ask because you're in this field and you must deal with this all the time. The whole concept of weight bias and the idea that you know there's a kind of discomfort, maybe even political incorrectness, to say, hey, you you're obese and we want to do something about this versus the body uh, image uh, you know positivity thing. So how do you navigate that? Because you're a physician like me, and we know that weight, especially visceral obesity, leads to metabolic syndrome. So we want to encourage the person to lose weight. So how do you do that diplomatically? Yeah. Yeah. This is is the, this is the, the problem of a primary care practitioner who doesn't have the privilege of having people referred to them because the person is highly motivated to lose weight. So you're describing, I think somebody who's presenting with obesity has risk factors, but hasn't yet acknowledged 
Is that what you're you're asking? Um, yes, I guess so. Or even even they're sitting in your room and they know. And you you mentioned that they're feeling bad about themselves and that that's actually a factor for non-compliance. Like, how do you navigate that that thing of saying, "Look, whatever weight you are, you're still a worthy person." All that. Oh, stuff. I see. Yeah. Versus, yeah. you have to lose particular weight, like a, a, a you know visceral obesity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is this is like um, a really heavy loaded question, only because everybody's experience living with high body weight is different. And I will say that most people I've come across in practice have described some sort of weight stigma, whether it's being called out on the subway or not making a basketball team because they're, they're a high body weight and their coach telling them. And these are experiences that people might have, they have as early as adolescence. And I don't know about you, but I don't remember anything that's crazy vivid about my adolescence, unless it was traumatic or unless I was really excited. And these people will describe to me experiences very vividly as if they were yesterday about being pointed out for their weight. Mm -hmm. And you've got to think that anything that has that much of an emotional impact must be to some degree, a traumatic event. It doesn't quite meet criteria for PTSD, but there is a sort of trauma that leaves an indent in the way that you perceive yourself. And I often like to describe to patients that their weight is not their fault. It's not a lifestyle problem because that's the way it's been conveyed in society. It's not necessarily a lifestyle problem because even if a lean person, let's say, let's say a lean person who was born in, I'll pick a country that doesn't have a crazy high prevalence of obesity, Japan. Somebody who eats in the same, somebody who's Japanese of your demographic, your age, your sex, eats in the same way as you, does not necessarily gain weight in the same way. And that typically resonates with people. It's like, oh yeah, you're right. Like I do have this vulnerability to be able to achieve a higher weight status. And so what we know is that there is a heritability to high body weight, similar to height, that if you have two tall parents who are tall, um, or if you have two parents who are tall, that your risk of being tall is up to 85%. The same goes for obesity. If you have two parents with obesity, your risk of developing obesity yourself in this modern day environment is up to 70%. And it doesn't mean that obesity is in your destiny. It just means that you're higher risk, that you have certain vulnerabilities, and that your genetics may bracket your weight at a higher weight status than somebody who doesn't have the same risk. And I try to counsel my patients on this type of information, the science and the biology because they've often believed so deeply that their weight is a byproduct of their choices and their doing. When in reality, okay, yes, there's personal choices involved, but at the same time, you clearly have this susceptibility to being a higher body weight and your brain is likely making it so that it's easy for you because it collides with this everyday environment and it's just easier to overeat. And so I'm really trying to help patients dismantle the beliefs that they have I'm not sure if that answers your question, but yeah. that's good. it's a good foundation because yeah. it allows them to start seeing, okay, I actually have a chronic medical condition. It's not necessarily just a lifestyle problem. Would, would it be fair to say, and this is a question that I often, I speculate, but I don't actually have statistics, that there are some people who just, not just that they have a predisposition to obesity, and maybe it's the same thing, but they have a predisposition to obesity, particularly if they're eating a higher carb diet, so that some people just genetically should be eating a more low carb, almost keto keto diet just because of the genetics. Would you say that's the case or no? Oh, you know, I don't know enough about that area. I think that that's growing. That's you're asking about precision nutrition almost, right? Mm-hmm. The, the idea so. of the idea of being able to genotype somebody and identify yes. what sort of dietary intake is more conducive to better yes. health outcomes. I don't think we're there yet. People will describe though, if they're consuming less refined carbohydrates and more, and they naturally consume more proteins and healthy fats and vegetables that they feel anecdotally, anecdotally that they feel more satiated. Yeah. They, and, and there's less of an exploitation of that reward brain, as you know, that triggers you to make you more motivated to seek out more. Like, you know, there's only so much chicken breast you can eat before you feel full and chicken breast alone will not be make the reward brain hyper excitable you've described before there's only so many blueberries like i can't eat a whole bag of frozen blueberries i think you've mentioned that before and that really stuck with me because it's true because blueberries aren't wrapped 
in fat, sugar, and salt. It's just yeah. a blueberry. It's fiber and sugar. <laughs> so I, I, I like that term. I don't. I haven't heard that before. Maybe it's a term in your in your world. Precision nutrition. I like that. Is that something that the, the bariatric? I mean, are you the cutting or not the cutting edge? Because you say you're not really doing it, but you're aware of this. Is this something that is an awareness in the bariatric community or not yet? I, I don't think we have the information yet. I think that okay. there will be genotyping companies that that okay. will market this, but I don't think that there's enough evidence to support its use just yet. Okay. All right. Clarissa, did you want to ask something about the uh, this stigma, weight stigma thing before I get to the other stuff I want to ask? Yeah, you no, were- I was just wondering if you had any insight into, we do sometimes clinically see individuals who eliminate some of these processed foods and then start over consuming, you know, the chicken breast or oh, yeah. even yeah. the blueberries. And do you have any idea like what yeah. that might be about? Do you think it's like the stretch of the stomach, maybe the release yeah. of serotonin? in oxytocin as the backdoor dopamine like what are your thoughts oh clarissa is so smart i can actually tell that you know a lot of you've read a lot about the neurobiology (laughs) of weight and so i think that that's that's a complicated question but and this is based on a clinical perspective from an obesity physician but when you are seeing your weight come down at a weight reduced state the effort required to maintain that weight loss becomes heightened So uh, Kevin Hall is a researcher who works for the NIH and he's done a lot of work in this area and he's written a paper on the weight reduced state. He talks about how with every, I believe it's a pound, I forget if it's a pound or a kilo, but with every pound or kilo loss that your metabolism drops by 30 calories and that your appetite drive will increase by a hundred calories. And you're describing the weight, the set point theory now, aren't you? Based on that paradigm, I think yeah, that okay, it's, sorry, it, yeah, continue, it's an continue. extension of that paradigm. Yeah, so continue. This yeah, the homeostatic drive will make it so that any weight yeah. reduced state is met with a reflexive oh. regain through metabolic changes and neurobiological changes of appetite hormones. And yeah. so with, th- with that, with your comment about people overeating chicken breast or blueberries, you're right. People can, you can still achieve a higher body weight status with eating healthy foods if they're higher in calorie or if you're eating enough calories. So I'm going to venture to guess that decreasing ultra processed foods may have related to weight reduced state and then concomitant increase in appetite. Yeah. I actually really love that because also clinically what I'm seeing is, you know, the volume starts to creep up as soon as they reduce that, but it doesn't necessarily always stay. At some point, there is some regulation that happens and people start to be able to not need as much, but volume seems to be the first symptom, one of the first symptoms that shows up clinically when they eliminate that. So this has been one of my favorite answers so far. I would be curious to see what their metabolic panel looks like though, because yeah. your, your, your blood work is likely going to look a lot different when, if you're eating a processed diet versus yeah. a diet that is less processed. So they might have yeah. a lower risk of diabetes and other things that are important to one's health, but maybe their weight doesn't change. You know, in my experience, the way that I would see this process, so there's a compensatory drive to eat more, for example, when your weight is down. And what we see in the food addiction world is the person feels more deprived. They're missing mm-hmm. that food. But our experience has been, and this is where I get stuck. I, I don't want to talk too much about this because we could just get stuck on this point. But this is where I do see that after a certain point, a person provides providing they continue to eat the lower carb or the lower processed food, then there is a new set point. Like they can actually comfortably be at a lower weight, but they have to maintain, they have to maintain that food. They can't go back to what they were eating before because their weight will shoot right back up again. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It it is like you gain weight with a vengeance. And I'm guessing that's partly what you're talking about. Um, Yes. Well, I don't know if it's with a vengeance or because people will describe gaining more weight Yes. beyond their baseline. Yeah. But, but there's been a thought that maybe that's the weight trajectory that they were going to be on even ah. without diet. So that, ah. that's another thought. You would never know though. Yeah, you wouldn't know. Yeah. Boy, that's good. Thank you. Okay, let's get back to, or I'd like to ask, um, just so the standard bariatric model is uh, surgery and pharmaceuticals. And you said that although you started behaviorally, you actually started to reincorporate some of that. So yeah. what are some of the, can you give us some good news on both fronts that people can know about? Because we don't want to just say that stuff is not useful. Clearly, yeah. there is some use to it. So what is useful that we can bring into our world? Yeah, I appreciate the open-mindedness there. 
there. I would say that it's not so much only pharmaceutical and surgery. The Obesity Canada Clinical Practice Guidelines came out in 2020, and they are a really welcome insight to how we're supposed to be treating obesity now. It's not just diet and exercise, and that they've actually incorporated psychological intervention into one of the pillars. So it's psychological interventions, it's pharmacotherapy and surgery. And then with when it comes to pharmacotherapy, there are two agents that are available right now in Canada that are meant to help target the appetite dysregulation that one might find themselves having when they live with high body weight. So there's Contrave, which is a combination of Wellbutrin and Naltrexone, which is an opioid blocker. And that's, that's marketed towards managing cravings. It helps with modulating that reward part of the brain so that you feel less wanting and that when you're eating those types of foods, you might not, it might not elicit the same sort of response in terms of like the euphoria that one might get. So before and, you tell us about the other one, can you give your clinical experience? How good do you find that drug before you tell us about the other drug? There's variable um, responses to it. it. It actually has, for some patients of mine, been a game changer because, and I often use it in patients who have mood disorders because it has the Wellbutrin component or yeah. patients who describe low motivation, fatigue, like not feeling concentrated because the Wellbutrin is really an active agent and an antidepressant. And so I find that their mood improves, their concentration improves, their cravings diminish, and they start to see less hunger. Like they see more fullness sooner. And so, so some patients have described that, um, They experience some side effects of it, like with any other medication, and have come off of it. But for the most part, when I started people on it, they've considered it to be largely effective. Okay, good. Yeah, and so the other medication is uh, called liraglutide. It's a GLP-1 agent I'm sure you're familiar with under the brand name Sexenda, and that's a once-daily injectable. Most people don't complain about the injection. It sounds a lot scarier than it actually is, and a lot of people appreciate that it is a hormone mimic of something that we're supposed to be have, uh, making ourselves from our gut. And it's really just a fullness hormone, but people will anecdotally describe that it affects cravings really well. And so both of these medications facilitate a calorie deficit so that you can see weight loss. And then it helps you maintain that weight loss over time. And on average, people would get between five to 10% weight loss. And how long, I think that we don't yet know for how long a person can be on it. Like the idea was six months or something, but now it's open doors to whenever. Oh, oh, oh yeah. So, so this is, this is part of the chronic care model that any sort of chronic disease that you get diagnosed with, yeah. whether it's diabetes or blood pressure, if you go on an intervention, yeah, you do want to consider it long-term intervention. Cause as soon as you come off of it, your weight, it's not like it would rebound, but it would just it would just, your appetite would reemerge and you would see regain. Yeah. And, um, this could be a life, a lifelong thing. Yeah. I never say that though, only cause you never know. Somebody might not like it. It might not be yeah. effective for them. So I just say, consider it a trial. Okay. Yeah. And also people are surprised because this is one of the barriers to treatment is that people don't want to start a medication that helps them with appetite because they feel like they should be doing it on their own. But you also don't know what you don't know. Like if it's a medication that takes away the preoccupation from food and allows you to lose weight without suffering, then maybe it, it's something that improves your quality of life beyond the weight part. Okay. Now, if a person was taking, let's say they're taking both of those, because you can theoretically take yeah. both, right? Would they then be able to eat a little bit of sugar, a little bit of carbs, a little bit of stuff, like basically stuff, regular food in moderation? Or yeah. would you still encourage... Yeah. So I've, most of my patients have described that they can, when they start an agent like this, that they feel like an, a lean person does around food, that they can have something yeah. in moderation and that they can actually stop. So with Contrave in particular, based on its mechanism of action, it modulates that reward brain, which is right. typically really vulnerable in somebody who has what you're describing, like addictive, like eating, and, and they feel like they can have just a little bit of it and feel satisfied. Right. But but like for those for somebody listening who's a food addict, it also means it's the same with alcohol that when you do have the drink or you do have the food, you're not getting the same buzz as you would have without the drug. Like yeah, it's it's blunted basically. Yeah, it is blunted because naltrexone is an opioid blocker, and when we yeah. eat those types of foods, ultra processed foods, the response is different for everybody. But let's say you're really you got a hyper excitable reward brain. Yeah, you're you're gonna ev- elicit opioids, endogenous opioids. And what are opioids? They're things that reduce pain, right? So we yes. take it for morphine in the form of morphine and hydromorphone, but we make our own. And yes. when we have naltrexone on board, it blocks the receptor so that it modulates that, um, that pleasure. Uh-huh. 
Uh, okay. What about surgical? What's your take on that? Yeah, surgery is something I always talk about when the patient qualifies. So the criteria is that uh, your BMI is over 40 or it's over 35 plus comorbidities like hypertension or diabetes. And then I will say for completion that the medication criteria is over 27 plus comorbidity or over 30. And so for bariatric surgery, I always start with this. This is the least popular option, but it is the most effective option. And I'm only mentioning it to you because it's part of your treatment options that you should have informed decisions when you're making decisions about how to lose weight. And so, so I talked to them about how people on average will lose between 20 to 40% with bariatric surgery. With medications, you could see between 5 to 10 or up to 20 for some people, depending on the agent. And so if they're telling me that they want to lose X amount of weight, and that equates to like 40% weight loss, I do say that falls within the bariatric surgery intervention, if that's the amount of weight that you want to lose. And it is, it has historically been seen as something that is like a plumbing method technique to reduce calorie intake, but it's so much more than that. We actually know that, yes, the, the gut is being rerouted or it's being modified and you're consuming less calories based on volume and malabsorption, but we actually see that the appetite hormones start to correct. So even the day post-op, like the day after your surgery, you're actually being told that you can discontinue certain medications. Like if somebody has diabetes, that they don't need to take their diabetes medications anymore in general. And that's because you're eating less, but also the hormones are correcting themselves. So that is a surprise for a lot of people. And you'd be surprised at how many people want to be put on the wait list after I describe to them what the mechanism of uh, action at the surgery is. You know, the the thing that I tell people when they ask me, you can tell me if I'm saying the right thing or not, or the wrong thing, is that uh, bariatric surgery is very effective very quickly. And uh, if you need immediate results, like within a year, because you're so obese and there's a concern about heart disease, et cetera, it might be a good option. If you've got the luxury to wait four to five years of gradual slow weight loss, the way that we would recommend by uh, basically precision nutrition, nutrition. uh, it takes a lot longer. But if you've got the luxury, then wouldn't it be better to do something without having surgery. But if you don't have the time, this is a very quick and well, quick option. Right. Yeah. But the other thing about surgery is that you're not always being undermined by the hypothalamus being like yes. that really strong yes. static drive to get you back up to the higher body exactly. weight. Right? Whereas, yeah, yeah with, with nutrition, sometimes you don't get to the lowest body weight that you could get with bariatric surgery because yes. the brain starts to get smart about exactly. what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and we spent a lot of time in the addiction model, like a lot of time trying to find all the ways that the brain is going to try to trick us back and, mm-hmm. and closing that up, like through basically a bubble of support and a bubble. Yeah of therapy and all and if you don't have the time or the willingness to do that it's not going to work so right okay good chrissy do you have more stuff before we move on i was just wondering if you have conversations with individuals about applying these behavioral and dietary approaches post-surgery so that the weight regain doesn't occur which often happens in our population who we see people who've had the surgery and then either blown through the surgery or they come back and they're almost at their normal weight again yeah i know i I was gonna i made yeah i made a mental note to mention that uh but i forgot that surgery is also not free of any sort of side effects of regain that it's not a, a perfect or a perfect cure for it i also get patients who come post-operatively several years uh, down the line and and say, I'm eating back to normal. I've eaten through my surgery and they're back at their baseline weight, which a lot of them have described as really distressing because they felt like it was their last line of options. Like that was their, like the end of the rope for them. They're like, okay, I'm suffering enough that I need surgery. And for those patients, see, this is the thing about obesity, that it's such a complex condition that it often masks these other things that could be taking place if we don't screen for them properly. Like Like, food addiction. Yeah. Like, like eating disorders, but also intertwined with mood disorders. Like if that's not addressed, then that becomes a problem. So my ideal is that is when I get to refer patients for surgery, because then I actually get to do the cognitive behavioral therapy with them. And they're actually excited because they are, they're already doing the work that is required post-operatively 
in the post-operative setting, if they're seeing weight regain, it's suggestive that the surgery was not addressing maybe the underlying problem. So there could be mental health problems, but it also could be that their appetite hormones didn't actually correct and that they were able to like maintain the same appetite. And so, so medication might be effective for somebody like that and in helping them trying to lower their weight. But it's really complex to treat. I mean, and you can also say that those could be the food addicts in the room. You'd have to screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. You'd have to screen. Yeah. Now, what about the other elephant in the room, or whatever the term is, alcohol? Do you have you noticed the alcoholism increase post bariatric surgery? Yeah, I've seen. I noticed this in even Renaissance when I was working with you with abstinence. I, I forget what it was, but abstinence from one vice and then turning like the crossover addiction to another, which is very, very representative of the fact that a lot of this is reward driven. Yeah. Um, Oftentimes people have a family history of addictions. And so post-operatively, I haven't seen alcoholism, but it's not a phenomenon that is, is surprising to me. I remember, I actually remember sitting in session with you, Vera, and I talk about this to this day, a young male patient who had everything going for him and knew of a family history of alcoholism and did everything in his power up until that point. I think he was in his thirties to abstain from alcohol and not even touch it because he knew of the the vulnerability and something went wrong and he started drinking and it evolved into full-blown substance use. And that always stuck with me because it just suggested that there is this heritability to this addiction towards substances. And obviously ultra processed food is considered a socially acceptable substance absolutely uh, that's glorified and it happens to exploit people's reward brains uh pretty effectively okay now i don't want to lose I, we, we've only got so much time left and you've got to talk to uh, please tell us about your cognitive behavior like what are some tools that you use what do you do with people with your perspective uh, the behavioral psychological perspective yeah i think that mats, we talked about the surgery now what do you do yeah so what do i do Generally right now, a lot of my sessions are group and I do a lot of teaching on the framework of cognitive behavioral therapy. And when it comes to CBT, most people will think that in the context of weight loss, that it'll always boil down to eating, like getting permission thoughts. This is what we call them. We call the distortions, permission thoughts, getting permission thoughts to eat at nighttime. um, And thoughts might be, I deserve it. I've had a stressful day. You name it, like everything compelling that your reward drive is really trying to like Um, cultivated over number uh, several years of conditioning. And so, yes, we deal with food and try to help people exhibit restraint in the face of impulses and helping them understand their high risk setting and helping them also understand that their brain is very good at learning, like learning when pleasure is about to be anticipated. And so that type of information, I try to get patients to weave into the narrative because when you're in the the midst of a high risk time, your autopilot is going to be on full blast. Like it's going to be very difficult to maintain attention to the counter dialogue that you need to practice restraint. And the idea is really to help you displace automatic permission thoughts that are of no service to you that often lead to overeating and replace it with rational values-based dialogue, helping you understand that this is an urge that'll come and go, helping you tell yourself the whole story so that you don't just stop at, I need to eat this because it'll feel good. No, tell yourself the whole story. Like Sandra Elias says, like, what's the aftermath? Like, how has this served me in the past? How do I want to feel tomorrow? How would my life look different if I actually chose a different response to this urge every time? So that's the eating component. Okay. That is much different from the very persistent, malignant weight stigma that people accept and normalize in their own narrative. And that's the stuff that I think is of value is really helping people address what are the thoughts that come up when you don't see the scale budge, when you experience an overeating episode, or when somebody says that when a family member calls you fat at your reunion, how do you, what is the narrative that comes up for you in those moments? And what does it typically lead to? For a lot of people, it will lead to overeating or abandonment of the health behaviors. But how do we counter that so that you can start eroding at the core belief that you in some way are a less person because you have higher body weight and that you deserve this sort of treatment? Like, How do we counter that so that you can develop your self-esteem in a way that helps you maintain these behaviors long-term? That's more important, I think, to address the weight stigma than the eating behavior. 
Right. Because that's the stuff that's going to allow for the eating behavior. Also. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So that's sort of what the essence of the intervention that you provide is like an eight to 10. Tell us about the program. So the, the, the logistics of the intervention are that I see patients right now in group settings. I do three groups right now in a month. One of them is teaching about CBT principles. One of them is just what I call drop-in. And that's when people share their successes, their challenges, and they get coached through problems and there's peer to peer learning. And then another one is just talking about nutrition and diet. And so I do those group sessions. And then I see patients once a month in 20 minute sessions where I dive into some of the CBT principles. I get them to read a book specifically called the Beck diet trap solution, but that's really just to give them a framework of CBT. Beck is being a key CBT person, right? Yeah, exactly. It was his daughter, Judith Beck, who wrote the book for diet. So it actually tells you to weigh yourself every day. I don't agree with that part, but it's just to give you a framework. And then we have something to talk about in session. And then what I've been developing, uh, because I understand the need for CBT, I've been developing an online CBT platform where there are videos, just five minute videos of me talking about a specific topic, for instance, how to manage stress eating at night. Listen to this video if you are experiencing stress and wanting to eat right now. And it's really just me coaching you through through in that moment. And so, yeah, 20 minute sessions. I expand it to 40 minutes if patients really need it, up to three sessions. And the program lasts a year, but really, am I really going to kick anybody out (laughs) when it's a chronic condition? It's hard to do that because people need the support and they don't necessarily get it all the time from their own family physician because there isn't enough time, right? So I try to keep people in in the program long. And if they choose to want to continue to see me, they see me. Okay. So can you give us a success story from this perspective? Yeah. The, I would say that The things that are really gratifying to watch are when I have a person, let's say uh, she was, I think, a 50-something-year-old female. And this is a similar story for like many of my patients, but 50-year-old female, long-standing history, lifelong history of obesity, family history of it, described binge eating disorder patterns when she got to me, felt severe loss of control over eating. So there's probably overlap with food addiction criteria. And described just a hopelessness with it. And I started her on medication treatment because we did try CBT and it was, it was largely ineffective because her autopilot was so strong. Her reward drive was so strong. She couldn't actually pay attention to the thinking and trying to change it. Started her on medication, helped to blunt the appetite and really give her the window of opportunity to start working on her thinking. And then Hmm. what we did was we started addressing thoughts about eating And then it segued into thoughts about self-criticism. She would look in the mirror every morning and tell herself really vile things, like many people do who have higher body weight. And over time, we started getting her to counter the self-critical thinking of you're fat, you're disgusting, you look like a sausage with, you know what, this is a no shit talking zone. Like that was just it. That was enough for her to really try to curb it, to accept that these negative thoughts were just part of her experience living with obesity and to really just try to land on something that would not lead her to abandon her behaviors altogether. And now the mind chatter is gone. Her her quality of life is so much better. Her mood is better. Her self-esteem is better. She has much more confidence. She's not at the lowest body weight she'd like, but she has acceptance and respect for herself. Yeah. And one of the things I know that Sandra says all the time, which I'm sure has, has influenced you because it certainly has influenced me where she says, my weight is not my business. Yes. You know, you, you do yes. what you can to maintain your weight, but the focus, sole focus on weight is something that even in our community, the food addiction community, we say it's not helpful to be focused. No, it's largely ineffective. I actually find that when patients are very weight centric, they're the least satisfied. But if you can think of your whole quality of life, like what is it that weight prevents you from doing and how do you get back to doing those things? The reality is that you don't necessarily lo- need to lose a tremendous amount of weight oftentimes to be able to live the life that you value. Right. Um, and so. you will lose weight. It may not be the cosmetic goal that you have. Yeah, exactly. The byproduct will hopefully be weight yeah. loss and metabolic health. Yeah. Okay. Chris, before I move to the larger picture, do you have something else you want to ask about? Uh, no. Okay. Okay. The larger picture. <laughs> So in the bariatric community of which you're part of, what do you see? First of all, your perspective is fairly unique. Do you see that as becoming more of a, of a, uh, in the larger picture, 
people becoming more and more accepting and we need to look at this behavioral piece? Yes. Oh, yes. I think that given that it's been written in guidelines now and that yeah, it's recognized, absolutely. obesity is now recognized as a chronic medical condition in communities like the Canadian Medical Association, the World Health Organization. Yeah. I think that we're, we're gaining traction and with the advent of new medications and real treatment options that actually provide people with hope that they don't need to suffer just because they have high body weight. I think the future is looking really hopeful. Mm -hmm. And actually, you kind of alluded to this when you came into this field, what, seven, eight years ago, you were like fairly unique, just being interested in this area. Mm -hmm. Whereas now, I guess because of medication surgery and behavioral, the whole concept of bariatric surgery is becoming more and more acceptable and a norm. Is that not correct? Yeah, I would think so. And also, the I, I don't know if I answered the original question all that well, but I think that the behavioral counseling piece, it no longer needs to be all about food and restraint with food when somebody's treated with medication because, and it'll give you opportunities to actually talk about the self-criticism, the weight stigma. And I think that CBT will be more geared towards helping people be adherent to their their goal-directed behaviors and their medication and consideration that they're, what they struggle with is a medical condition and not a lifestyle problem. So okay. I, think, I think that the behavioral counseling piece will grow eventually. Now, given that, uh, do I, as an addictions physician, food addiction physician, is there any room for hope for me to see food addiction as being more acknowledged in the bariatric world? Because it isn't really now. You're an unusual person in that we stumbled upon each other because of this A-bomb thing. Yeah. But uh, is there hope that maybe in a few years that actually I will be, or not me specifically, but our thinking will be more acknowledged? I don't have reason to believe that it wouldn't be, to be honest, because there are respected researchers in the field looking at this work now. I can think of Sanjeev Salkallingham. I remember seeing you at the workshop at CAMH. Yeah. Um, one year that, yeah, that, that people are looking into this. It's just that right now we don't have very robust data. What it'll show when we look, do more systematic meta-analyses and things like that, I'm not really sure. I think that the, the trouble with food addiction is that there's a lot of overlap with other conditions right now. With, like I, I could think of binge eating disorder and bulimia nervosa. Yeah. And that it's hard to do a meta-analysis on a condition that hasn't been acknowledged because it's kind of buried with under like other diagnoses. Right. right. Yeah. So, okay. so I think I, I don't, and I also don't think that, I think that it's growing because there are people who are more interested in obesity medicine and it's hard to turn away from the uh, community of food addiction because you guys are really loud. Like you're loud in a good way. <laughs> that you're, you're advocating, like you advocate and it's a strong community. I know Sandra Ilya is one of like the leaders of uh, food addiction in Canada and her community is a, a, a really tight knit tribe. Yeah. And yeah. she's infiltrated into the uh, obesity Canada network. So yeah. Yeah. She's infiltrated. Like that. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> I like that you say that we're loud. So I was going to say, do you have any advice like for us to become, I guess it's to get more research and to be loud? Yeah, well, it's, I think that you doing this and being open-minded and interviewing bariatric physicians who may not agree with you every single like principle of food addiction, I yeah. think that that is the way to gain traction. When you're closed off, like some certain communities are in weight loss, like there's a lot of heterogeneity in the way that people treat. There's the keto people and then there's yeah. other... Like when you're closed off and you're refusing to listen to any other group, then that's when you start to get conflict and you get controversy and you get people who may be like, there, there's more polarization, but I think there's a lot of synergy that can happen. And I know that because Sandra and I are clear examples of how obesity and food addiction can synergize to create something that is helpful to a community of people who are struggling. Yeah. And you guys are doing a great job. So, I mean, that's great. Okay. So now you, so in terms of the future of bariatric medicine, we got an idea of that. Is, do you see any promise just as a final statement about that what is the most the leading promise in bariatric clinical work is it is it the surgery pardon not the surgery the, the medications or like what what do you see as something that we should be watching for 
I think that the dismantling of weight being a lifestyle problem is there. I think there's a lot more, when you see media, there's a lot more body diversity now. Lizzo comes to mind for me that she's uh, somebody who lives with obesity and is very empowering in her message. So there's the weight stigma piece I think is being dismantled. And then the medication advancement is a big one. There's a lot of, not a lot, but there's a couple of medications that are in the pipeline that have weight loss interventions that provide outcomes similar to that of bariatric surgery. So I think that that's really exciting and gives us a lot of hope that we can actually treat it for people who are interested in medication options. Okay, good. And now you, what is next for you? What do you see happening in the next one year or five years in terms of your work? I think I just want to be more scalable. I want CBT to be more available to people, which is why I'm creating the CBT online platform. I want to do more work and collaborate with Sandra because she is just, she is my spiritual leader. Honestly, she is my Oprah. I call her that all the time. And (laughs) um, I've been working more on meditation and trying to incorporate that into my own practice. So not only talking about CBT, but talking about more of the mindfulness and present moment awareness that is important to stress regulation. Because a lot of the underpinnings of people's behavior is prompted by stress and stress wipes out the part of the brain that helps you pay attention and regulates yourself. Right. So I think that that's something that's important to address too, is chronic stress. (laughs) Okay. Chrissy, do you want to end with our signature question? Yeah, absolutely. So we kind of framed it so that it would be particular to you. And that is if you could tell a younger version of yourself, something about obesity or food addiction, what would it be? Oh, I didn't prepare. I didn't even think about this question. <laughs> I forgot about it. I skipped right over to Yuna. Um, <laughs> Which we have okay, to let me read. For you. Let me see again. If you could tell a younger version of yourself something about obesity or disordered eating food. Oh, I know. It would be that just because you're told that you can't help people with obesity because that's the job of a dietitian. Like it, it stems from that sort of theme that just yeah. because somebody, a so-called mentor tells you, something that you feel really strongly about, it doesn't mean that you have to listen to them. And I don't know of a better way to say that, but it's really just about if you feel passionately about something, like I'm sure Vera had probably hit many roadblocks in your your journey towards pioneering food addiction. You don't need to fit the mold. Like you can go out of the mold and it actually, the more resistance you face, the more important it is <laughs> that somebody's going right. to benefit from your work. And, and I felt like at that time, that was like, a, that was really a, like, I could have bought, that was a bifurcation for me. I could have followed what that family doctor told me and just, yeah, you know, resigned myself to general practice, which there's nothing wrong with, but I wouldn't have been doing the work that I feel really uh, passionately about now. And so despite her saying that, I still continue to persist. So I think that resilience is an important thing when you feel really um, that something is very important to you. Oh, fabulous. This will be a great place to end, but I have a better place to end. And that is, please tell us about your little doggy, Yuna, because we are small doggy lovers. So my Um, dog, Yuna, I will tell you a fun story about (laughs) Yuna that, and I won't take too long, but we got her because my dad at the time was palliative. He was somebody who was high functioning, worked a job every single day that he enjoyed doing because he loved being with his friends. And then the cancer took that away from him. He became isolated at home, didn't get diagnosed with depression, but I believe he would likely have depression. And my brother decided to get a Pembroke Walsh Corgi. So we opened the door one day and there was a cute little dog looking at us. And my dad took that dog under his wing. And since that time, Yuna has been known as this, what we consider like the lifesaver of that time. During my dad's care, he lit up. He had purpose. Yuna gave him a reason to get up and walk outside every day. And then over time, Yuna actually became part of my clinical practice when I was at, um, when I was working at another clinic. And she would come and see patients. And anytime patients were crying, and I, I do believe it's because of her upbringing, being exposed to my dad in this fragile state, that he, she would just go to patients and sit under their chairs and provide them with comfort. And she does that for us. And so anytime I see her, I think of my dad and I think of how much she is a part of our family as much as my brother is. And she's been with us for, it'll be seven years this month. And she's great. She's excellent. I, I think that dogs, I've had patients who, who cry more about their dogs passing away than family members passing away. <laughs> and if anybody wants to see a picture of you, know, we're going to have it on the website. Yeah. 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 We'll put it, I'll send one to you. I'll send you a great one. Oh my God. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Van, for spending the time to speak with us. Thank you for giving us the platform to chat. Thanks. 
Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours.